Now this evening we are going to continue the discussion from this morning. If you want, you can call this a part two from this morning's lesson, but really it's all one giant outline that we're going through. Uh, we will finish it tonight. Uh, so we've been talking about a history of instrumental music in church, uh, rejecting it, not as uncommon as you might think. Let's start here tonight. 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 9. Uh, shows us that the Lord's people have always been a peculiar people. You look at this group tonight, I can just tell you're a peculiar group of people. Uh, the New King James Version says we are God's own special people uh, who are different from the rest of the world. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 17, God commands, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse 4 shows us that others will look at us and think that we are strange for the things we do and teach because we're different from the world. And they will, quote, speak evil of you, according to this passage. So yes, from the beginning, the Church of Christ should, by now, be used to being categorized as different and unique in comparison to everyone else around them. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15 says that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. God's people have always stuck out like a sore thumb in this world. And this morning we noted that today in the 21st century, uh, the Church of Christ sticks out like a sore thumb when it comes to its music in comparison to other churches out there. Instrumental music in, quote, Christian worship, I put it in quotes, uh, is so widely accepted nowadays, widespread, that many people have never been to a church that doesn't worship in song with mechanical instruments and music. Some say, I've never heard of a group that doesn't use instrumental music in their singing with, their, with all their songs. Now, that's rather odd for a group not to. And yes, even though God's people are said to be a peculiar people, we discussed this morning how for hundreds and hundreds of years, up until just about the past 250 years or so, rejecting instruments in Christian worship assemblies was not as peculiar as you might think. Uh, in fact, this morning we put it this way and studied this. Did you know that the majority of people who have ever claimed to be Christians or tried to be Christians, that is from A.D. 33 when it first started, all the way up until today, the majority of those claiming to and trying to be Christians have rejected instruments in worship. And if you hold this view today, you are actually among the majority of Christian people if you hold this New Testament tradition, which is written in Scripture, to sing a cappella, as we would call it, instead of using mechanical instruments of music. Because this was the majority viewpoint. For over 1,800 years, if you add all the people who lived during that time period and compared it to the people today who believe the instruments are right to put into the worship of New Testament Christianity, we're actually in the majority is what I'm talking about. Uh, so today we are seen as being in the minority on this issue. Certainly we are because literally everybody else today in our time period uses instruments in worship uh, with only a few exceptions. So if you only talk about the people living today, we are by far in the minority. But if you were to go back through history, take account of Christian men and women who lived long before us after Christianity started, you would actually find, as our lesson this morning bore witness, that the majority of them did not worship with instruments in their Christian gatherings, but in fact, they rejected such an idea as error and sinful. Uh, it was the most common theological position and stance for hundreds of years, and it was actually those who were trying to incorporate instruments into Christian worship who were seen as the crazy ones. And so tonight, we will continue looking at this testimony from history of early church historians who wrote about music in the church. If you didn't get to listen to this morning's lesson, it's online. I can get you this whole outline if you'd like it. Uh, and we'll just keep, keep confirming tonight that Christian people rejected mechanical instruments in their worship 
for a very, very long time, over a thousand years, besides those in the Catholic Church who started adding it. As we also mentioned this morning, uh, when we go through and read these quotes and study the reasoning behind why these individuals believed that musical instrument would be wrong in church worship, they all seem to give one of three reasons that we discussed this morning. Why do we reject instruments in Christian worship? They said these three things. Number one, incorporating instruments is to resort back to Judaism. Number two, incorporating instruments is idolatrous in the church. And number three, mechanical instruments are inferior to that of the human voice, the true instrument God wants to hear. This morning we read quotes from individuals, and we only made it from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. It's pretty much as far as we got this morning in history. Uninspired men, yes, but the evidence was very clear as we studied of what was actually taking place in the churches among that time period. That no mechanical instrument of music was being used in Christian worship throughout that time. But they all sang, as we would call it today, a cappella, to copy the pattern that was laid down in the first century church and was written in the New Testament. Before things slowly started changing, uh, they all held to a cappella singing in their gatherings. And the argument that was the heavy favorite among these early Christian writers for why they rejected instruments in worship was wrapped up in argument number one here. Uh, incorporating instruments was to resort back to Judaism. Right? This was their view. Okay? They said, hey, when God set up the pattern for Christianity, he made a direct change in many things, distinguishing the Christian religion from the old Jewish religion. Many things have been done away, They've been altered, nailed to the cross. God started over and used that as a foundation for his true religion. So the priesthood was changed. He goes through the New Testament. The, the sacrifice was changed. The worship was changed. And part of what was changed in the worship was the music. So their position, as, you, as we read these quotes from those who lived in this time frame, the early church, was this. We reject instruments of music in Christian worship because, hey, that was an element of Jewish worship. We didn't do that. We don't do that because that's what they did. We can't add instruments back. Our a cappella singing under Christ's new covenant is part of what sets us apart from the old system that was nailed to the cross. God made a distinction. Now, we can't go back, they said, to quote the shadow of good things to come, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, or the weak and beggarly elements, Galatians 4, and verse 9, if we bring back the instruments and we put them in Christian worship, then, man, we might as well just open it up and bring back animal sacrifices and the incense and the physical priest and the physical circumcision, Levi the Levitical priesthood, the Sabbath day, and on and on the list goes. You open up a can of worms. So this whole system of worship was done away with when Jesus died on the cross. We can't go back to the elements of the Old Testament. Uh, let me reread a quote they used this exact argument. I thought this was a good one from this morning. We already read this one, but uh, Nicetas of Remiens, uh how do you say that? I, I thought it sounded like Louisiana, but it's Remiens. I don't know, whatever it is. His name, and then uh, 333 A.D. to 414 A.D., he said this, It is time to turn to the New Testament to confirm what is said in the Old, and particularly to point out that the office of singing psalms is not to be considered abolished. Right? And we were talking about here, we, we still turn to the Psalms to, that we can sing from these. We could sing Psalm 23 tonight, we often sing. He said, it's not to be abolished merely because other uh, many other observances of the old law have fallen into disuse. Listen to what he says. Only the corporal institutions have been rejected, like circumcision, the Sabbath day, uh, sacrifices, discrimination in foods. So too, the trumpets, harps, symbols, and timbrels. For the sound of these, we now have a better substitute in the music from the mouths of men. That was one of my favorite quotes from this morning that we looked at. He said, man, part of what was done away with uh, when the Old Testament was nailed to the cross, along with the Sabbath day, the old sacrifices, the circumcision, the food laws, was the instruments of music that they used in their worship. 
Uh, Those things were part of what died at the cross. But under the new covenant, he said, God has replaced the mechanical instruments with, I like that phrase, a better substitute. The mouths and the voices and the hearts of men and women. And here was this outlook that we discussed this morning in the New Testament. You yourself are the instrument in the house of God. That's the idea. The Apostle Paul said, I want you to sing and pluck the heart to the Lord. Ephesians 5.19 was the meaning in the original language. Don't pluck the physical instruments, which was the type. Pluck your heart strings and sing to the Lord, which is the antitype. Right? Your heart is the instrument. Your entire being is the instrument. I don't know what the number is tonight. Maybe uh, 35, 40 people. We have 40 instruments here tonight, but not that kind of instrument. Uh, the mechanical instruments of the Old Testament were foreshadow- foreshadowing a new instrument that would be played more beautifully than any, and that is the hearts of men and women. God wanted this instrument in his New Testament house of his. So, you know, I, I mentioned it this morning, but I think it's interesting that so many people will try to justify instrumental music in Christian worship because they say, well, all the Jews, the Jews used it in their worship. You read about it in the Bible because you read all through the Old Testament about these instruments. And that's why we should be able to use them today because it was in the Old Testament. And why I find that interesting is because that is the precise reason why the early Christians believed they ought to reject instruments in their worship. Because that was part of Judaism, and that was nailed to the cross. In fact, half of the New Testament was written urging Christians not to turn back to the old system in any way. Not binding circumcision, not binding this, or resorting back to that, but putting those things away, moving forward. Not to turn back to, quote, the shadow of the good things to come, but to submit wholly to Christ. Colossians 2.17 said, These things were just a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. If you are going to go back to the system that was foreshadowing Christianity, you might as well open up the whole barrel and bring back the animal sacrifices, the burning of incense, uh, the Old Testament priesthood, etc., Yes, it was interesting how many of these men we quoted from this morning, from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century church, they were not using instruments, and they used this as their reasoning. All right, one more quote from this morning just to wrap up, and then we'll move on to our list tonight. It was uh, John uh, Chrysostom from 347 A.D. to 407 A.D. He said, uh, David formerly sang songs, as also today we sing hymns. He had a lyre, and that's an instrument in the Old Testament. He had a lyre with lifeless strings. The church has a lyre with living strings. Our tongues are the strings of the lyre. A different tone, uh, with a different tone indeed, but much more in accordance with piety or reverence. It says here, under Christianity, there is no need for the cithara or for stretched strings, or for a pick that you pick on the instrument with your pick, or for art, or for any instrument. But if you like, you may yourself become a cithara, mortifying the members of the flesh and making a full harmony of mind and body. For when the flesh no longer lusts against the spirit, but has submitted to its orders and has been led at length into the best and most admirable path, then you will create, listen, a spiritual melody. He goes on and says, if one enters the sacred chorus of God now, there's no need of musical instruments. As the Jews praise God with all kinds of instruments, so we are commanded to praise him with all the members of our bodies, the eyes, ears, mouth, etc. So the point of reading all these quotes is to simply recognize that these early Christians believed and were providing this reasoning for why a cappella singing was what they did and why they rejected instruments in worship. It was done for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. And so we'll uh, pick up there on our list. We'll keep on going. Uh, We left off in the uh, 300s AD, so the fourth century. Uh, Let's continue seeing now from history, uh, people trying to follow Christ who were still opposed to instruments in Christian worship because it was an identification of Judaism and it was excluded from Christian worship when God gave the command.
So next uh, is a quick statement from the Catholic men who were at the Council of Carthage, Carthage in 937 AD. Together they said, On the Lord's Day, let all instruments of music be silenced. So this was still the view of even the Catholic Church who said this at the time. We don't want to hear any instruments of music on the Lord's Day. They ordained, I suppose you could say. Uh, play them throughout the week if you'd like in your secular lives, not worshiping God, sure, but let them not be heard in the house of God on Sunday. In fact, it almost sounds like don't even let them be heard on Sunday. Don't even let it be associated with the Lord's Day. All right, next, uh, we're about to, and again, keep in mind, these are all uninspired quotes. Remember, these, these men did not, uh, were not writing with the same authority as the Apostle Paul, so take what they say with a grain of salt, but here's what they thought. Here's how they interpreted everything. Uh, so we're about to jump ahead quite a few centuries now. Um, you remember talking about Pope Vitalian bringing in the organ uh, into the Catholic Church around 657 A.D., the first recorded instru uh, instrument in the church. Okay, But we will notice that this was not widespread, even in the Catholic world, for about another 400 years is what we're going to observe. It was not widely accepted, even though that's when it happened, which was still 600 years after Christ and his apostles. Even after that, it still didn't catch on for a very long time. Okay, this was the first occurrence. Most places, even Catholic places of worship, continued to reject instruments of music, even after the Pope brought in the first one in the 600s. Uh, you can read of a man named uh, Amalarius, a bishop of the Catholic Church who lived from, here's the time frame, 780 A.D. to 850 A.D. is when he said this. And we'll notice that he, along with others, had not adopted yet mechanical instruments, even though they were Catholic. Right? And this was over 100 years after the Pope brought in the first organ into the Catholic Church. This man wrote about music among his group of Catholics, and he said this, Our own cantors, or the word is singers, grasp neither cymbals, nor lyre, nor kithara, nor any other kind of musical instrument in their hands, but rather their hearts. Uh, for in so far as the heart is superior to the body, to, the ex uh, to that extent does what takes place in the heart better manifest devotion to God than what is done in the body, talking about playing with the instruments. So he said, the melody that's performed in your heart is far superior to the melody performed on your hands or with your body by uh, playing an instrument. So he says this about their music. He says, the very singers are the trumpet. They are the psalterium. They are the kithara. They are the tympana. They are the chorus. They are the strings and the body of the instrument. They are the cymbals. So again, men trying to please Christ 740 years after Christ came, uh, use the same argument. We don't use instruments. We are the instrument. Each Christian uses their hearts and their voices under New Covenant worship. And speaking of Catholics, uh, there was what's known as the Catholic Encyclopedia. This was actually, we'll jump all the way ahead for a minute, to 1905 when this was written. But they are actually referring to the first thousand years of the church. Uh, and listen to the Catholic Church admit that musical instruments were not widespread, for over a thousand years in church history. Uh, here's what it says. For almost a thousand years, Gregorian chant, without any instrumental or harmonic addition, was the only music used in connection with the liturgy, which is the worship service. The organ, in its primitive and crude form, was the first instrument. And for a long time, the sole instrument used to accompany the chant. So for a very long time, there was it was... No, non accompanied by any instrument. Then they brought in just the organ, and for a long time, that was the only instrument that they would use. Uh, now, listen to this part. I think this is interesting wording. It says the church has never encouraged. They said this in 1905, by the way. The church, the Catholic Church, has never encouraged and at most only tolerated the use of instruments. The church hold, holds up her ideal that the unaccompanied chant and polyphonic a cappella style. The Sistine Chapel has not even an organ. 
Now, this was written in 1905 uh, by Catholic leadership. We will note that an organ was actually installed in St. Peter's Basilica in 1952 after this quote was written. And a newer Swiss organ was put into the Sistine uh, Chapel uh, in 2002. So they went back on this and they went ahead and put organs in there. But yes, in 1905, as, as, soon, as far on the timeline as 1905, the Catholic Church described exactly what we've been discussing. That for over a thousand years, the widespread way of worshiping and song in Christian worship was done without instruments. Uh, even when the organ was added, most Catholics only tolerated it, he said, uh, and it wasn't encouraged by most. Next is a Jewish Christian named Midrash Tehillim, which uh, lived in 900 A.D. to 1000 A.D. He said, The rabbis gave definition or definite expression uh, to the view that vocal music was superior to instrumental. The Holy One, blessed be He, will say to them, Even though you praise me with psalteries and with harps, your praise is not sweet to me until it comes from your mouths. And again, the Holy Spirit, or the, the Holy One, blessed be He, uh, said, I desire from Israel not music of the heart, but the solemn utterance of their mouth. Now, of course, I don't believe these to be true direct quotes from the Holy Spirit or anything like that, um, but this was their, the common view. This is what men were saying. And that music from the heart and from the mouth of, mouth of man was more acceptable to God than the psalteries, the harps, and other musical instruments that was used in the Old Testament. They were still saying this all those years later. Next is another Catholic you might have heard of. He lived from uh, 1225 A.D. to 1274. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, I think there's a college named after him somewhere, uh, was considered in history to be one of the Catholic Church's greatest uh, theologians and uh, philosophers. So mind you, the quote that we're about to read was spoken just about 600 years after Pope Vitalian added the first organ in the church. So 600 years for the, the organ to even be added, 600 years later, here's what we read. Um, you know, and could, because listen, one, one would assume that organs would have caught on everywhere. After the Pope put them in, oh, and then everybody started using them. No, it's actually not the way it was. But listen to what Thomas Aquinas said about the Catholic place of worship where he attended 600 years later than that. He said, our church does not use musical instruments as harps and psalteries to praise God with all. Well, why not, Thomas? Uh, that she may not seem to Judaize. That's exactly what we've been talking about. That's our argument. We, we keep instruments, we've kept instruments out of the New Testament church because that was an element of Judaism. We do not want to Judaize. And by the way, this was 1,200 years after the time of Christ and his apostles. He adds, uh, instruments of this sort more move the mind to delight than form internal, internally a good disposition. It's just, it's just an emotional thing. Under the Old Testament, however, there was some utility in such instruments, both because the people were more hard and carnal and needed to be stirred up by instruments of this kind as by promises of earthly good, and also because material instruments of this figured something. So I point out where Thomas Aquinas said, instruments, quote, more moved the mind to delight. What does that mean? They move the mind to delight when you hear an instrument. Well, I think that means the reason everyone likes instruments is because they sound pretty, right? Or they tickle our ear. We, 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 uh, we enjoy mechanical instruments, and it moves our hearts to delight, which is really the reason why instruments kept being pressed of, we want them in the church. Let's add them into, into the church. Right, slowly but surely, it kept being pressed by people throughout the ages. It was not because God asked for them or because God even wanted them in Christian worship, but because the people wanted them. Right? God never asked for them. Yes, if God had wanted them in the Christian plan for worship, he surely would have asked for them. He would have set it as the pattern. Uh, he did that in the Old Testament. And uh, he, through David, they brought in instruments, and God uh, ordained that. But as, as we all, as all these um, writers agree, the New Testament was silent on adding instruments, which inherently meant the practice died at the cross with Judaism. Next, here's another Roman Catholic. Uh, 
uh, Cardinal uh, uh, K. John, or how you say that, 1469 to 1534. He uh, says, referencing Aquinas' remarks, which we, which we just read on instrumental music, Cardinal uh, K. Chetan, I think that's how you say it, gives this comment. Tis to be observed, the church did not use organs in Thomas's time. So here is this Catholic cardinal in the 15th century pointing back to the time of Thomas Aquinas, who we just quoted from, who lived 244 years earlier in the 13th century. And he says, it's clear to note that the church was not using instruments in the 13th century. So get this, the Pope in 657 added an instrument into church worship, but it did not catch on, not fully. Sporadically, uh, some among the Catholic faith would use instruments here and there, and they would, would do it, but some would not. Many would not. But 600 years after the Pope added the organ, uh, you see that the Catholic Church had stopped using instruments again and went back to singing a cappella, or at least the vast majority of them did. Then the Cardinal writes this, he says, whence, even to this day in the 1500s, the Church of Rome does not use them in the Pope's presence. And truly, it will appear that musical instruments are not to be suffered or allowed in the uh, ecclesiastical offices we meet together to perform for the sake of receiving internal instruction from God. And so much uh, the rather are they to be excluded because God's internal discipline exceeds all human disciplines which reject these kind of instruments. So this Catholic said, instruments are to be excluded. Uh, they, they weren't being used in Thomas Aquinas' time in the 1300s. They're not to, we don't use them in the, in the 1500s, and we shouldn't use them either. All right, um, next we have somebody you probably heard of, uh, Martin Luther who lived from 15, or 1483 to 1546, considered one of the fathers of the Reformation movement. You might have heard of the church that people started after and according to Luther's beliefs. It's called the Lutheran Church, uh, the Lutherans. And if you ever study with a Lutheran about the topic of instrumental music and they think you're silly and they say, I can't believe you're saying we shouldn't worship with instruments, show them what their founder, I suppose you could say, believed about the topic. Here's what he said. The organ in the worship is the insignia of Baal, a sign of the devil. The Roman Catholics borrowed it from the Jews. So he actually commented more on the topic, uh, but I think this will do. Uh, Martin Luther believed, number one, adding an organ to worship is a symbol for Baal, which is a false god. Uh, there's, there's where you get this idea that many believed instruments not only to be directly associated with Judaism, but also with false gods and paganism. All right, so many, such as Luther, looked at the pagan religions and how they used instruments in their assemblies, and they said, why would we add to the Christian assemblies instruments of music when we're known for our pure a cappella singing, right? The, the Jews use instruments, the pagans use instruments, but Christians are known for their pure voices and singing from the heart. So instruments, as we see uh, throughout history, are often associated with idolatrous worship during this time too. So many of the, uh, the world religions started using instruments. Number two, he said it's a sign of the devil in the midst of the church. Number three, he said the Catholics borrowed this practice from who? From the Jews. And so it's a symbol of Baal, it's a sign of the devil, he said, and they borrowed it from the Jews. Next, how about one of the other reformers? Uh, John Calvin, 1509 to 1564 A.D. So now again, there's a lot that we disagree with Calvin on regarding his teachings uh, and his salvation, all these, I mean, we, we hate Calvinism, what he did, but many... Um, you know, maybe you are going, going to study with Presbyterians nowadays, and they think you're silly for adding instruments, or for rejecting instruments, sorry. Just have them take a look at this quote from John, John Calvin, they're, they're, who they're trying to follow, his pattern. Um, he said, musical instruments and celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting up of lamps, and the restoration of the other shadows of the law. Where did those practices come from? From Judaism. He said, 
The Papists, therefore, have foolishly borrowed this, as well as many other things, from the Jews, who are the Papists. Well, those are those who follow the Pope or the papacy, so the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholics, he said, borrowed. They're the ones who borrowed instrumental music and put them into Christian worship. They borrowed it from the Jews. And then he says this, men who are fond of outward pomp may delight in that noise, but the simplicity which God recommends to us by the apostles is far more pleasing to him. So notice that he refers to a cappella singing I like this word, with simplicity. That would define what we do when we sing together. Um, we don't got to get all prepped and set up and make sure we understand all the chords and everything. Singing as a group is such a simple practice. You don't have to know how to read music. Right? I know people with beautiful voices in here that have never read music a day in their life. But we can sing to the Lord. He said it's far more pleasing to God was Calvin's take. Calvin says... Uh, Paul allows us to be uh, to bless God in the public assembly of the saints only in a known tongue. First uh, Corinthians chapter fourteen and verse sixteen. The voice of man assuredly excels all inanimate instruments of music, and yet we see what Saint Paul determines uh, concerning speaking in an unknown tongue. What shall we then say of chanting, which fills the ears with nothing but an empty sound? I think that's an interesting concept that Calvin just brought out regarding chanting and musical instruments. You know, Paul, he references in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, said that words spoken in worship need to be able to be understood, right? right? It's for the purpose, when we, when we get together and we, and we sing and we teach, it's for the purpose of conveying a meaning. We're, we're doing it from the Word of God. Uh, we're teaching, we're instructing, we're edifying using our words. Therefore, the idea here is, what purpose do empty sounds serve if they don't have words? Right? And I think that's a really good point. If we are commanded, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, those things have words instructing each other, then what it would be the purpose of something that only makes a melody right? if it has no words? An instrument can't instruct. Uh, an instrument, a mechanical instrument, can't teach anything. I don't learn anything because I listen to a beautiful guitar. I like it. Talked about that this morning. But it can't, it can't teach us anything. It can't urge us to do anything because it's not instructing in any way. And all it really does, we've already talked about, it arouses the emotions, what instrumental music does. And it quotes from Thomas Aquinas, moves the mind to delight, is what he said. So it's, it's something that men are closely uh, attached to and like to have in worship to amplify their emotional state. But uh, that doesn't necessarily do anything to draw us closer to God. Many people just want to come to church. To nowadays, you go to any church service, they want to come for an emotional high, just like you're going to a concert. But the truth, but in truth, uh, the instruments can't do anything for you spiritually. But man, the words of our songs can do something. You ever leave here being encouraged, not by the awesome sermon presented by the speaker, just kidding, but by the songs, the awesome songs in accordance with what Scripture says. Here's another quote. Um, uh, 1562 A.D., the Hungarian Confessio Catholica, must be a different language, uh, says, concerning musical organs, it is certain that in the ancient assembly, referring to Judaism, and in Solomon's temple, the use of musical instruments was accepted. Now that Christ has come, and together with the ancient priesthood and sacrifice and the representation appertaining to the law, the use of instruments in churches has vanished like a shadow. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 says, For the law of Moses, having a shadow of good things to come. They kept referencing this phrase, so uh, they said the Mosaic system had foreshadowed Christ's covenant in many different areas, but when Christ died on the cross, it caused the Mosaic system to vanish away like a shadow. Uh, so it was with the instrumental music. Next is a quote from uh, Deprecian Synod of 1567, which is essentially the creed of the Calvinists. 
The musical instruments, however, adopted for the pantomime mass of Antichrist, together with images, we abhor. By the way, he is referencing the Catholic Church when he uh, refers to the Antichrist who uses images of Christ and God and who brought in instrumental music into the worship. He calls them the Antichrist. He says about instruments, there is no use for them in the church. And indeed, they are marks and occasions of idolatry. Now, I, I believe, I, I mean, I agree with that statement. I think that statement's true. Uh, mechanical instruments are and can serve as an occasion for idolatry. Would you agree with that in the worship itself? Uh, we, you know, we consider how oftentimes the worshipers come and want to hear beautiful music that tickles the ear. And that's a lot of times what, why people come uh, to different services in this world when God never even asked for it. So God doesn't want it, but they desire it anyway. So what's it called when you put some other passion or desire in front of God and what he's already asked for? I call that idolatry. I fully believe that instruments in the worship service in many cases serves as a form of idolatry to the crowd. People get an emotional high from the entertainment. They are drawn to that. Instead of actually being drawn to God, they're drawn to the awesome performance that's up on the stage. And that has nothing to do with New Testament Christianity. You know, I, you can go to a concert that is non-Christian based, you know, and go and listen to some country singer as long as they're clean or whatever. And you can get the same emotional high at a secular concert or listening to some music at a coffee house. And you can leave one of those functions and say, Man, I really enjoyed that. That was good for just, I felt so good. That was great. But even though your emotions get amped up at an event like that, and you, you leave, oh man, that was fun, doesn't necessarily mean you were drawn any closer to God or instructed. It's just a pastime. So, so people like having their ears tickled. Uh, and when we do what we want instead of what God wants in worship, that's the root of idolatry, that we're pleasing ourselves. We're trying to do what we want. Next is Henry Ainsworth from 1571 to 1622. The manner of singing is to be holy, reverent, graceful, orderly, with understanding, feeling, and comfort to the edification of the church. Instruments of music are so closely associated to the songs in the temple as incense was to prayer, Second Chronicles 29. Such shadows are ceased, but the substance remaineth. The substance remaineth. Uh, next, Scottish minister John Knox, 1514 to 1572. He is the founder of once the Presbyterian religion coming from John Calvin's teaching. He's the founder of the Presbyterian religion. We learn that Knox considered the organ uh, to be, quote, the devil's kissed of whistles. They uh, had the organ and the high kirk of Indenburg removed. They took it out of there. So, and by the way, a kist uh, is a chest or a box uh, containing something valuable. So he said here, the organ in the church is the devil's chest of whistles. I can kind of hear a Scottish guy saying that, can't you? Well, that's a, the devil's kist of whistles. I, don't, I can't do an accent very well. But... There's also, um, we keep going, Cuthbert from 1622 to 1654. Uh, he, was, he was listing the great sins of the Catholic Church, and here's one of the things he said on the list. Number one, introducing in, instru musical instruments together with, as organs, harps, viols, etc., were in the New Testament, where in the New Testament God requires the voice as the only organ of the heart in worship. No musical instruments are associated with the New Testament singing of psalms, hymns, and songs. The New Testament church is patterned after the synagogue and not the temple, he said. That's an interesting concept. Uh, the synagogue did not have musical instruments. And when the temple was destroyed, the Old Testament used the outward observance uh, was done away with. The synagogue remained. Uh, next one is Johann, uh, Johann Casper so curious, uh, 1619 to 1684. Uh, he cited the Council of Carth Carthage, which we read earlier, said, On the Lord's day, let all instruments of music be silenced. We read that earlier. 
And he remarks that but a few in his own time favored the use of instruments in the church. So notice that. He lived in the 1600s. And he said only a few individuals that I know of favor the use of instruments in church. So even in the 1600s, we see this testimony that instruments in Christian worship was not a popular practice. It was a, a growing practice by then. More and more people were starting to use it but still not popular and still not as popular as it would later become. Most still sang a cappella. Uh, man, John Wesley, uh, 1703 to 1791, founder of the Methodist Church. Uh, does anybody have any Methodist friends? Quote for them, I have no objection to instruments of music and our worship provided they are neither seen nor heard. <laughs> can have them in here, just don't play them. Adam Clark. Uh, it was a Methodist theologian, a Bible scholar, and he was a Methodist theologian. He said, I am an old man, and I here declare that I never knew them to be productive of any good in the worship of God. Music as a science I esteem and admire, but instrumental music in the house of God I abominate and abhor. Now, I agree with that. Right? Instruments outside of worship, he said, I esteem and admire but in the house of God, I hate them. Uh, this morning, I talked about how I used to play guitar in coffee houses and different events like that. And me and Wayne will get together and we'll play on the side. And Caitlin plays. Right? I, I, I love instruments of music, but I don't believe them to be acceptable in the house of worship. Right? Lastly, we'll close with an individual you can quote for your Baptist friends. Okay? Do your Baptist friends ever make fun of your stance on instrumental music? Let's hear from uh, Charles Spurgeon, 1834 uh, to 1892, a very famous, very famous Baptist minister. He said, we do not need them, instruments in, in worship. They would hinder rather than help our praise if we were to put them in here. Sing unto him, as the New Testament says. This is the sweetest and best music, no instrument like the human voice. What a degradation to supplant the intelligent song of the whole congregation by the theatrical prettiness of the quartet billows and pipes. He says, we might as well pray by machinery as praise by it. We ask why, or when asked why, he quoted 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. And added here, Spurgeon preached to 20,000 people every Sunday for 20 years in the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle and never were mechanical instruments of music used or allowed in his services. So listen, that wasn't even 200 years ago. right? In conclusion tonight, people today act like we're so foolish for rejecting instruments in Christian worship. They've never heard of the concept. But many of them don't realize the history of this argument and the history of people trying to follow exactly what the New Testament pattern said. So yes, most Christian people to ever live held this argument that we talked about tonight. Most Christian people, people trying to be Christians, rejected instruments in worship. Why? Because the New Testament specified vocal singing. Not for instruments. Mechanical instruments were a trait of Jewish worship. Is found nowhere in the New Testament pattern. And so hopefully you can use that um, lesson for when you study with people and they ask about worship and how we're to please God and why we don't use instruments. Pull some of those quotes out when you go and do your studies on authority, the law of exclusion, and all these different things on worship to God. Uh, so if anybody needs a printout of that, um, I wasn't going to do it for everybody, but if, you, if anybody wants any of that, I can print it out for you. Um, but that's our lesson tonight. Um, if you're not a member of the Lord's Church, you need to become a member of the church you read about in the Bible. And how you do that, the Bible says, is by hearing the Word of God, believing that gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross for man's sins. We can tap into that because we have access to this awesome message. You need to repent of your sins because you believe that. He's not going to forgive any sins you won't repent of. And so that's a change of mind that's going to lead to a change of your life. You need to confess that you do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the great confession 
uh, getting you closer to your salvation, and then you're baptized in Christ, immersed in water for the remission of sin, the removal of your sin. It adds you to Christ and His church, and we just need to remain faithful. Once we've entered in, we have access to His blood until the day that we die, as long as we remain faithful. Uh, so if anybody needs to come forward tonight for any reason, uh, please come while we stand and sing.